Hello again and welcome to the Master's Voice. I'm Celestial and you are welcome to this channel. To old and new subscribers alike, you are very welcome. The Master's Voice is an audio and a visual resource on multiple channels, so I always recommend that if you're new here or if you're still getting the hang of the channel, you're very welcome. And look below the video in the description box so that you can find out where you can follow, where it's most comfortable or convenient for you. Audio or visual, audio means that it's in podcast form, so I don't think that there's a comment option there. There's no video, but it's good for people who are busy. It's good for people who are on the go. And then you have the video options here on Rumble, Bit Shoot, Brighteon, as well as a Spanish language channel. So there's quite a few options for you to follow through with. And without further ado, I'm continuing in the group of prophecies that are called the Slavery Chronicles, the Slavery Chronicles. So it was a five part message, but the first part was just an introduction. So I didn't make that into a video. And so far I've made part two, which is America in Chains. And please understand that the Slavery Chronicles was a bunch of visions that I received all at the same time on the same day. So the first one, America in Chains, is just talking about the fact that God revealed to me in that vision for the first time, something very, very shocking, which is that slavery that we often think of as an ancient evil, something from ancient times and not so ancient times as was practiced here in the United States and in other European nations, God said that slavery would be coming back to this earth. And that was a very groundbreaking, shocking thing for me to hear. And so the whole Slavery Chronicles revolves around the United States of America. And the point of the Slavery Chronicles is dealing with the punishment with America as a nation. And what God is saying in the Slavery Chronicles is that as America had slavery in the past, he will punish the United States with slavery in the present. So just as slavery happened in the past, it, it had slavers, those who actually did the enslaving, and it had slaves, those who were enslaved, those who had to provide the labor, those who had to do the work, those who were treated with unimaginable cruelty, and who had to give up their lives, personhood, and everything else that they were entitled to as people, just as there were subjects who were treated as objects and those who were doing that. So God is saying that nothing has changed, that in these modern times, he will repay the evil of slavery back to the United States upon the descendants of those who committed those acts. And so I have carried out part one, which is America in chains. And I have carried out part two, which is a cup of wrath for there to be a deeper understanding of what the Lord was saying. And so the last two parts of this Chronicle series will be looking at now who are the subjects and for what reason will God bring back slavery upon this earth? So if the slavery is coming back, we have understood that, or at least hopefully have understood. But for what reason would God bring an evil like slavery back to modern times? Why is God going to repay people such a brutality for brutality? Is God an eye for an eye person? Is God not merciful? Could God not forgive? With something so far in the past, surely we should move on. It's over, it's done. We should try to heal and move on. But as you have heard in many prophecies in the past here on the Master's Voice, these are not my own opinions. And I stand behind God 100% in whatever God is saying. Whatever God is saying, if God says there's sin, then there's sin. If God says he will cover that sin, then yes, God will cover the sin. But if there's a sin, whether it is abortion, whether it is transgenderism, whether it is simply gossip and lying that a person is using to destroy the lives of others, God says he is not going to forgive something, then I am here as his representative to speak what he has given me and I will say it no matter what the response is. So God is saying that this particular ill of slavery, it's not as if there hasn't been slavery everywhere else in the world or that other populations haven't suffered it. The Lord is saying specifically, that for the slavery of the groups that he calls his people, he will not forgive, he will not cover it, he will not overlook it, he's going to repay it in full, and that is just as he has said. And what's more, the Slavery Chronicles is also closely tied into 
um, a series of prophecies that I've been doing, I think, just since the new year, since January 1st, um, dealing with the Jews that everyone thinks are God's real people. So you can't have this, this series of prophecies, which is almost five years old, um, without understanding the ones that God brought first. So see how he is methodical. God first started talking about those who he calls, those who say that they are Jews and they are not. You can look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9. You can also look at Revelation chapter 3, I think, and verse 9. Those who say that they are Jews but are not, and they do lie. Those who are a synagogue of Satan. So God is saying and has said, and it has been declared here, that the people who live in the Middle East, that everyone says are the true Jews, are not the true Jews. They are imposters. They have taken on the identity of another people. They have perpetrated to the entire world that it is them that are the modern day descendants of the people in the Bible. But God has exposed these people and he said that he will continue to expose them. And he says that he will tear them down publicly to such a low place. They will fall from being a very high community that has basically almost encircled the world and put free speech on lockdown. You can't really speak about the Jewish community. People always use code on the internet and I see it and I guess they have their reasons for doing so. But here we are just going to speak plainly so that all can have the understanding of what the Lord is saying. And here we go. This is part four, the Slavery Chronicles, Buffalo Soldiers, part four. And I received this, the same as the other two, June the 7th, 2019. And so the day before, I had just been hearing this word um, relating to this animal. The animal is called a bison. It's almost like... Um, Bison are almost exactly like buffalo. They're almost exactly like, a, I don't know, a very, very huge type of, it's not quite like oxen. It's not quite like cows. They're much bigger, similar family, but they're big and black and woolly and they're very um, ornery. They're not, uh, they're not easy going and they're not easy to domesticate, right? So they're very much wild animals. So I kept hearing the word as I was going about just my business on the 6th of June, 2019, bison, bison, bison. The word would just come up in my spirit and I would see the animals either grazing or, you know, running in formation as if, you know, fleeing from danger, but I couldn't figure out what it meant. And then late in the evening, this is when the Lord began this series of prophecies that are now entitled the Slavery Chronicles. And in this part, I will explain to you how it was. The Lord gave me a message for the American Indians of the United States. And I have it written down here, just one sentence. This message is for God's people in the Americas. So that's Canada, the United States, and even as far down as Mexico and South America. You can look at all, these groups can all consider this message, but specifically for the American Indians that you can find here, American Indians, and also in Canada. So... On the evening of June the 6th, this is 6th into 7, I saw a very strange thing. I saw several visions happening all at once. It should have been very confusing, but it was not because each vision was its own layer happening on top of the next one, like different movies playing. I understood that all the visions were linked together by a common theme, judgment coming upon the nation of America for her crimes, past and present. So the first layer is America getting rejected by the Lord Jesus Christ and those two captains, Russia and China, coming to grab her and carry her off to boats to ship her off into slavery. And as she's going in the boat, the last shreds of the flag that she had used to try and cover herself that had already been very torn, the flag flew off and came off and America went naked onto the boats to slavery. The second layer was a massive cup of judgment that was in the process of falling over with a few men and women on one side where the rim was weakest, trying to hold it up and stop the cup from overflowing. And then in this third layer of the vision, I saw, a, I think it's called a step, a step or a step A, S-A-S-T-E-P-P-E. -E. Um, it's not material. Basically, most people refer to it as a field. 
And I just thought it was very odd because the word was very clear in my mind. And I thought, Lord, this is this is almost like an old world English. I mean, we have the word. It's still it's still in use, but nobody really uses it. People just say field. But I could see these vast, vast areas across the Midwest, very good farming land, you know, with grasses and everything, good rain, good soil, good drainage. I was seeing it, but I was seeing it so far back in the past. This is before the Europeans came here, before any settlers came here. The land was just open, wild, and free. And I was seeing America before she even received her new name, the new land or the new coast or the United States of America. And I saw a bison herd, a bison herd, um, I saw a bison herd, my apologies, running across this field, such a thunderous movement on that flat ground. And behind them, a man was running. Now, please listen to this because the characteristics of this man, um, if you are true Israel, now that we've established that it's not the Yehudim that live in Israel, if you are true Israel, God is going to start bringing these characteristics back in you and your children. God is going to require a lot of things from Israel. And there are many things that the Lord has told me personally that I don't talk about. I don't talk about um, it with anyone. I don't actually get into this topic with people because there's so much talk about it and everybody has an opinion and everybody's watched a thousand YouTube videos. And I'm one of the few people that doesn't need to watch YouTube videos to know this. This topic is so close to God's heart that I cannot impress upon it upon the hearts of all people. You do not have to be true Israel to listen. When something is very important to God and you claim that you love God, it is incumbent upon you to know what it is that the person you love takes seriously. So all of you that have a wife, that have a husband, all of you that have a girlfriend or a boyfriend that you're hoping one day will be your wife or a husband, the extent and the lengths that you go to to see to that person's happiness, you don't need me to tell you that some of you can go extra. Some of you are willing to strip and rip every rose on earth to scatter it around a thousand fields, a thousand football fields to propose to one woman. But when it comes to knowing what God wants as a man who claims that he will be the leader of a household, a husband, a father, you barely know what the Bible says. You barely know what the word of God says. You're not willing to deep dive into it to be the most excellent leader that you can be. But as Christians, whether you are a Christian under the heading true Israel or not, if you love this person called Yah, if you love this person called Jesus Christ, then the things that are important to him will be important to you. And one of the things that God is going to do is, as God is restoring true Israel, God is going to bring back this same kind of, I can only call this strength, this same kind of strength, this same kind of proper manhood, proper womanhood, God is going to restore this back on his people. And it's one of the things that's going to make God's people glorious. It's one of the things that's going to make God's people remarkable. You are not going to dress like a stripper in true Israel. This thing, it gets on my spirit so much to see the way that men and women present themselves, and yet they will still want to say, yes, we are, we are it. We are true Israel. How can you claim to be of God? And yet outside your external representation is so poor that no one would ever believe you to even be a Christian. Talk less of being God's chosen, God's lead, God's first the first fruit, so to speak. Where is the love to represent him aptly, more than adequately and excellently? How do you want to be so eager to claim title to something that you are not even aspirational towards? You are willing to work for a promotion. You are willing to work for an engagement ring. You're willing to work for, to be the first um, in the basketball team or in the football team or in the first in the gymnastics team. You're willing to work for many things, but at the same time, to work for God's heart, to be proud of you, to work and so that when people see you go by, they say, look at the glory of God upon that woman. Look at the glory upon that of God upon that man. Why does Israel want to bring up the rear in so many areas and yet at the same time claim we're the people, we're the people? Can you see how regal the people in the Bible were? Can you see how stand out they were? Could you see how everywhere they went, even when they were in captivity, as long as their hearts were cleaving to God and as long as they were God-centered, centered, 
as long as they were almost like a sundial that follows the sun, as long as they were following the Lord Jesus Christ, they stood out because there's something about the presence of God that rests upon a people that must distinguish those people. But if those people cannot be distinguished except for bringing up the rear or for falling, then there are many things to be worked out. There are many things to be worked out before Israel shall stand in front of God and start singing the songs that the old prophecy says they're going to start singing at their regathering, the rejoicing and all of that. You have to put away the gods from your midst. And I don't understand why this is not generic. And that is because a lot of true Israel doesn't even bother to practice true Christianity at all. A lot of true Israel actually rejects Christianity, rejects the Lordship of Christ, calls him a white God for uh, brainwashed Christians. And I don't know who you think is going to open the door to heaven for you. The Koreans will get into heaven ahead of you if you reject Jesus Christ because he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. There is no other road. No one comes to the Father except by him. You reject him, you might as well just carry yourself off, buy yourself some real estate in the hottest part of hell, and get ready for the judgment day because no one is coming to him, Jew or Gentile, except no one's coming to God except by Christ. So this man that I saw running behind this bison, this man was so massive and so strong that I didn't know if I was looking at some kind of Marvel superhero or what. This man had barely any clothes on and he was the epitome of what we call masculinity, strong and ripped with a head full of hair running more than halfway down his back. This man had so much hair running down his back, flying in the wind. He hardly had anything on except for that little thing that um, um, Native American men wear, the little apron in the front and the back. And the most amazing thing about this man is how he was keeping pace with the bison herd. Now, this, these animals have four legs, and whether they are spooked or whether they are just traveling or whether they are outrunning lions or whatever it is, these are big animals. The, the bison of the past are not their little relatives of now. This is a big, massive herd moving at pace. And this man was not winded. This man was not 500 miles behind them. He was fast and strong enough to keep up with the stragglers of the herd. And he was running. I didn't know that a human being could run like that. But he was chasing and close to the last one in the back. And then he gauged his stride. He gauged, gauged his, his throw or something. And he loosed that spear with so much power that it went zipping to where the bison was. And it hid, it hit the neck of a medium-sized one. So this wasn't a baby and this wasn't a bull. It was one in the middle and that thing fell and rolled and the herd ran on without thinking about that one but the man raised his hands in victory and he threw his head back and he gave this eerie cry from the core of himself right from the bottom of his lungs and i understood looking at this vision that what celebration this man is celebrating and then i started to hear the cry come back to this man from other lungs nearby the same loud cry excuse me please um, started coming back from other people and I realized, oh, this man is not alone. And very quickly, other men dressed like him ran up to him and they were slapping him on the back and throwing their head back and giving this kind of like a wolf howl, but not quite, just some kind of cry. And then the understanding was coming on my heart as I'm looking at this vision. Oh, this is a test. This is the manhood test. This is actually a young man, even though he's so big, but this is a manhood test. And the tribe needs to know that this man can hunt because before he can have the right to marry, he has to be able to prove that he can hunt and that he can provide and that he can be a surety for the other men that when they go out hunting, he won't be making the kind of mistakes where they have to come and cover him and they have to come and protect him and things like that. But he can be a useful part of their male herd. So everybody was congratulating him and I could see the, the buffalo that he had hit, the bison that he had hit was dying and then the vision faded away. Now, from my point of view, I'm looking at 
four visions at the same time. I'm looking at America being chained and carried off and Jesus is not helping her. Jesus was not helping her. Jesus will not get involved when Russia and China attack the United States. You're going to be asking, where is God? God is going to be right in the same place he was in 9-11 and right in the same place he was when Iraq was bombed. He's going to be on the throne. That's the first vision. And then the cup is falling over and I'm watching the people struggling and I'm knowing in my heart, heart that because of the weight of unrighteousness and sin that we see in America, America has not reached her apex of sin. So if you're sick of the things that you're seeing, please just uh, get some good rest because it hasn't gotten going yet at all. And I'm seeing that. And then I'm seeing the last two visions, which deal with identity of who God's people are and why he will not stop Russia and China from bringing slavery upon the slavers and why he will not stop the cup of wrath from coming. And so I'm watching all this and it was amazing to me. This was five years ago and all this stuff was still brand new to me, even though I know other people have been knowing about it for a very long time. And then the Lord began to speak. So please listen, because this message is to American Indians, wherever you are, whether you are in the United States, whether you are in diaspora, whether you live in Canada or you and your ancestry are somewhere else, the Lord says, you are my people and I know you very well. I was with you since the time of the stars and I know your names intimately. Each one is engraved upon my hunting belt and I will give a ransom for your souls. You were discouraged, dying and in poverty, imagining me to be a silent and brutal witness to all your pain. But I say to you now, I will give a ransom for your life and redeem you. I will bring you out of the cottages where they have driven you and speak kind words to you. And I will lead you back to my inheritance, which I have promised you in the canon of my word. I am Yahweh, your father, the one whom you call the great spirit. And in days to come, Dreams and visions will multiply greatly in your communities. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Then you will remember yourselves, and I will gather you from all the places where I scattered you and let you forget yourselves because of your unfaithfulness to me. When you shunned me and you bowed down to idols in nature, the tree, the owl, and fish. You raised up effigies to worship that were not me. Therefore, I judged you and I let your enemies overtake you and strike you on the hills. But now I say, a life for a life and eye for an eye. I am coming. I will bring justice and requite the blood you have lost. I will honor you in the day I declare that you are my inheritance and I will give you peace and a remedy for your wounds. Rest. The healer is coming. I will make things right. And so the prophecy that I'm announcing here in the hearing of whoever wants to hear it and receive it is that the Lord Jesus Christ will make himself known to the scattered and the penned up. This is trapped. This is when people have been shoved and kept limited. And that is exactly what has happened to the American Indians, Native Americans of the United States and everywhere else. Um, they have been trapped, they have been limited, they have been driven off of the whole vastness of this land that they had before settlers got here. And they were given, given very limited and unproductive areas to live in. So that is what it means to be penned up. It literally means to be like an animal on a leash whereby you cannot go or you are not allowed to go as far as you would have gone if you were not trapped in a pen. By a dream and by a vision of the night and even by visions of day, Jesus is going to appear to this community and he is going to make them understand by his power that he is their God. He will forgive them for every other image they have worshipped and adorned themselves with, and he will adorn them with recognition and respect as a special inheritance, which he says will be revealed in end times Bible prophecy. He will call them by the individual names he has given them, 
Now, I do not know all their names, but the names that I was hearing as the Lord was speaking to me, one is Shawnee, one is Pawnee, one is Blackfoot, and the other is Crow Feather or Crow. This, is, this does not mean that this is an exhaustive names of the, I guess, the genealogies that run among the American Indians. And if you look in the Bible, you will see that if it's the tribe of Asher, there's a whole host of names under Asher. There's a whole host of name, uh, names under Issachar, a whole host of names under Judah. And this is why it's very important not to get caught up in so many things that America has gotten herself caught up in. America's caught up in the study of maps, which is not bad. And America's caught up in the study of I think some kind of chart, there's some kind of chart floating around, oh, this tribe is this tribe and that tribe is that tribe. And I've, I've always looked at this thing since the Lord brought this to my understanding, since the Lord brought me to what they call, oh, waking up, waking up. I've always wondered, where, where did you get that chart from? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit the author of that chart? Why are people so confident in talking about things that they haven't even taken two to five seconds to go and ask God. Some people are on their knees before God night and day to get the pure approximation of this thing. They want it from his mouth. They want to know. And you know something? I'm going to be very transparent here. I am not one of those people. This is some people's night and day, lifelong research thing. Even in, in white communities, there are people hunting with their whole soul because they want to know the truth. They are pestering God like Anna and Simeon. Can we see the Messiah before we die? Anna and Simeon did not know each other. They did not know that they both had the same prayer before God. Can we look at the Messiah before we die? There are some people, this stuff means so much to them that it's almost to the exclusion of everything else in the Bible. And that can be a good thing. And that can be a bad thing. There are some people who are studying the genealogy of the tribes to the point where they're not developing Christian character. They're not practicing love because of the knowledge of this thing in them. They have become so hateful. They have become so racist. They have become so exclusionist. They are the brand new gatekeepers that God never hired standing in front of the gates of heaven and shutting it against all other people. This is where obsession with this truth has led them. It is a good thing to have a heart that is after the truth. It is a good thing to have a heart that wants to know truth. Why wouldn't you want to know truth once God has brought it to your attention, whether it's through a YouTube video that you watched or whether it's through an email that someone sent you or whether you were reading the Bible and God began to give you, give you understanding. Why wouldn't you want to know the truth once you realize that you live in a world of lies where everything Every single thing, whether it's a sacred thing or an ordinary thing, almost everything has been touched by and tainted with misrepresentation, lies, deception, perversion, twisting it upside down, occlusion. This is using a lot of storylines and a lot of documentaries and a lot of this and that to hide the truth. Why wouldn't any heart be seeking for truth? But at the same time, why would you not also seek for the whole truth so that you can understand? Being Israel is not shutting the door to other people. Jesus Christ, I always say this, is a global phenomenon. He is the gift that keeps on giving to all the sons of men. And in fact, when Apostle Paul got tired of Israelites behaving in the exact manner that they behave now, he simply declared what God had told him, go preach the gospel to the Gentiles because these people are impossible. I am God, you just got here, Paul, and you don't understand how rock hard their hearts and their heads are. Go take the gospel to other people because I can see in other people the desire to love me. I can see in other people the desire to spread my word. I can see how far the gospel will go actually once you get out of this tight clique that thinks that they are it. Go and preach the gospel to other people and I will provoke them to jealousy when I show, when I show them just how loyal the hearts of my other children can be.
The way I came to this understanding was not by watching videos. I don't like to talk about my life. I don't like to talk about my personal stuff because I have seen that this is how the American church has been destroyed. The American church has been utterly destroyed by the cult of me, the cult of moi, the cult of you don't know my story, you don't know my journey. The curse of this nation is the podcast mic at present. Podcasting equipment needs to cost $2 million and there needs to be a very stringent test before people can touch the microphone to start speaking because the flood of information that is coming out, there's some people who just need to say, sir, it's best if you had not said anything. It wasn't a person who brought me into the understanding of these things. It was the Holy Spirit himself. And I think he brought me into it because if he hadn't brought me into it, I would have just continued in my Christianity forever unbothered, unmoved, just deepening it in reading the scriptures. But there was a veil over my mind concerning this thing. And if the Lord was going to call me and use me as one who brings out truth to his people, how can such a fundamental truth, this is a pivotal truth. This is a core truth to man, not necessarily. Man is only hyped up about it because man can read the Bible for himself and see how central this thing is to the father himself. This is, if God ever had a pet thing upon his heart, this is it. Because the entire Bible that you're reading, no matter your background, no matter your race or your skin tone today, the entire bi Bible that you're reading is essentially a dance between the Lord and a people that he called out. There was no Israel before. There was no Israel before. Genealogy was continuing. The Lord only made this promise afterwards, picking out Abraham in the line of Shem. Babylonians were there before. The people who built the Tower, tower of Babel were there before. This thing is the Lord's idea, but he was still the Lord of all the peoples. So if you just apply your mind Noah didn't get on the boat with Shem alone. For those who practice exclusionist theory, that man got on the boat with his three sons and their three wives and his wife. And from those who survived those floodwaters come all men. When Jesus Christ was lifted up, the scripture says, if I be lifted up, I will draw Israel to me. Is that what it says? If I be lifted up, then only Israel can come. Only we, the people, can come. Only the 12 tribes can come. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And so there is room for a grafted-in Gentile root. And this was actually the method that God used to bring me into the wisdom. Like I said, I don't like to talk much, and I don't like to discuss things much, so... The abridged version was just that I've always been dedicated to the Lord. This thing is not a game for me. This is heart, soul, life, body, till, till death. Either till death or till the end. But here in New York City, um, we have what are called Hebrew Israelites. And... By the grace of God, and because he has grown me, I can, I can say this. When you, when you interact with some of these men, um, you have to be tough. You have to be, you have to be robust in your self-esteem. You have to be robust in your responses because they, they will literally batter you, uh, with words. Um, if you've ever had an encounter with the camps, male or female, uh, their approach uh, leaves a lot to be desired. And I'm choosing my words carefully here. Their approach leaves a lot to be desired. It's not a blanket statement, but the interactions that I, I would have. And it seemed when the Lord was ready to bring me into this knowledge, it was in um, 2016. It was in 2016, towards the end of the year, I think September. But towards the beginning of 2016, um, I just would have these encounters. I'd be going to church and then you come out of church and you're so filled with the glow of the Holy Spirit and you're so filled with the songs and the word. And then you're walking and then they would just be there and they start 
calling out to you and calling out these questions. And if you don't want to engage the questions, then they're calling out things at you and telling you in any way we see, you know, we see that, that church, that particular church, and they're calling the church names. And you don't just do that. At least you can do that to some Christians, but you can't do that to me. And so these interactions, they put a kind of thorn in my heart, but I look back now and I can see that sometimes God is preparing a a person for something. And if there is something hard there, he will need to crack it. He will need to remove it. Now, the thing that was hard was not here in my heart area. The thing that was hard here would be in my mind area, which would be how can God just appear and start telling me the true Israelites are these people, I would have said, go away from me, strange voice, because please remember that the Lord started to bring many things into my life in 2012. So the Lord had shifted so many goalposts in my life that naturally a person will be slightly protective of whatever goalposts remain. I'd already said to the Lord, Lord, if you need to remove it all, if you need to remove my entire foundation in Christianity so that you can give me this prophetic foundation that you are giving me, then please give it to me. Give it to me. I had been 10 years in salvation already when God had started talking to me. And so it was like, give it to me, Lord, give it to me. Um, because you've been here, if you've been here in the master's voice and you've been hearing what I speak about, I know that it has kicked a lot of your foundations. If you, if you have any foundation still left besides your name and your social, then you're a strong person. But if you come here and you listen, you will realize that the Lord will remove everything that you thought was true Christianity. He will remove everything that you were expecting. He will remove everything that you were experiencing. And that's because the old belief system cannot, you won't be able to survive with it in the B system. It's absolutely impossible. You will just melt. You will break down. You will be destroyed. And so in this area, I had no knowledge of this thing and I didn't learn it off a YouTube video. I didn't learn it from whatever. Um, Someone sent me an email once and I remember looking at the email and reading the email and then looking at the documentary that she had attached to it. It was like a five or six part documentary that's still very popularly watched out there. And I just thought, what most people think when they hear this? I thought, what does it matter? What does it matter what what color Jesus was? Jesus is for all of us. And if you're watching, there are quite a few people who think that now. And you don't need to swallow those people because that is the absolutely ground base level understanding of what we have been taught. And so I just thought casually, what difference does it make? And I just left that email. I never went any further than that email. I never watched that documentary. And so here's God, perhaps hoping that that would be an opener and it didn't work. And so he's thinking, "Mm, how do I get to her? And then all of a sudden, it was as if Hebrew Israelites never existed in this New York City until that year, 2016. I'm sure these guys have been here forever. But in 2016, they just began to pop up. They would just be here and they'd be like, hey, sister, be like, oh, my hairs of my soul. And then... It got to the point where it was so much. And one day there was an altercation. There was an altercation. I was with a very good friend and they insulted my friend so bad. And I got into it with them. And I was asking, what makes you think that if there is truth and you apprehend one small part of the truth, what makes you think that even if what you're saying is true, that you are allowed to hold it like a leg of lamb and bash strangers over the head with it. What makes you think that you have the right to approach sovereign humans in this way, to demean them, to dishonor them, to curse them? Do you think that the Lord will receive you in this posture? Do you think that God will have a heart for people who are rude and curmudgeonly and so abrasive and so dishonoring to another person? And we got into it that day and there was a If God was hoping that it would go right, it went way left. And there was a wall up in my heart. There was a wall up in my heart. And um, one day 
I, I came from, I was coming from, I don't know where I was coming from and I had to take a train. And so I'm going down the train steps and as I'm coming down, you know, our steps, we have layers, There's one layer flat and the second layer, if you're going way down. So I'm coming down the second layer, which means I've already done a lot of work coming down these stairs. And then I start to see the robes of the brothers. I start to see the robes of the brothers and my brain is like, not today, not today, not now. And I was thinking, I'm going to climb these steps back up. And I was tired. And I thought, you know what? I won't. I'll just go. I'll just walk past. And if they say something, I'm not going to engage. And so I come down the stairs and these brothers are not saying anything. They are not wearing black. They're not wearing purple. They're wearing white. They're wearing white, which is odd. I've never seen that before. And these guys were so... I don't know. There was something about them. It's not like they were radiating, but I mean, they had their hair. One person had their hair braided and the other person had this full Afro picked out. And there was just something about them. And they were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, inclusive of Jesus Christ. They weren't talking about no roots of Jacob. They weren't doing anything like that. They were, they were seeing how can you in this late hour not know that the son of man is returning how can you not know that he is coming back? How can you not want to return unto the father, to his laws, to his ways, to his righteousness? And I was standing there and I was waiting for them to do some of the usual and they never did. And as I stood there, the Lord spoke to me and he said, do not despise your brothers. And yes, I did side eye. I did side eye to the Lord like, what? And that is what he said. Do not despise your brothers. And I thought, well, all right, Lord. And I got on the train and I went home. And many months passed after that. I wouldn't see any of those gentlemen again. And then um, one day I'm in church. I mean, church when it's good. The music is good. Even the announcements have been good. We haven't even gotten to the word, but you just know the Lord has put his foot in this house this day and heaven is going to come down on all of us. I'm worshiping with my whole heart. We don't have a five minute worship, 10 minute worship. This is a good 35 to 40 minutes because worship is actually what softens the human heart. You come back from a, a, a week full of disappointments, of, of missed deadlines, hard work, all kinds of things, noisy children, stress, and things like that. And sometimes you, you will need, you, you, are, you need God, you need the music. And so uh, just give me a moment, please. And so my heart was open, my heart was open, and I'm worshiping, I'm right in the middle of worship. And the Lord says to me, you are of Judah. And I said, yes, Lord, mm -hmm. the tribe of Judah, and you are the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that's just us, two Judahites together, me and Jesus. And I'm singing, and the Lord says to me, you are of Judah. And I say, yes, Lord, that's right. Grafted in, praise God, by faith a child grafted into the tree. That's me. Because all through my Christianity, at times the Lord would just say to me, you are of Judah. And what I took that to mean is that the word of God is here and the 12 tribes are here. And now we, we who exist now, it wasn't even in my mind that the people in the Bible are continuing. It's not that I took the people in the Middle East to be anything. For some reason, I've never connected them and said, oh, they are from the Bible. In my mind, for some reason, I just thought that just how the Moabites, some tribes have been wiped out completely in the Bible. So just how the Moabites have been wiped out in Amalek, this is Haman's, Haman's people. Uh, God said that he would have war against Amalek forever. Moabites wiped out, um, Amalek wiped out, Philistines wiped out. Certain tribes angered God too much for him to allow them to continue. So I just thought, oh, you know, Israel has just moved on, but now we are spiritually descendants of, but it was not like that. So the Lord would say, you are of Judah. And I would say, yes, Lord, I am. I am in the spirit of Judah, just as you are of the tribe of Judah, because Jesus Christ lives forever to make intercessions for the saints. So obviously his Judah nature has never stopped. It has never passed on. It's eternal. And that's what I would think, you know, 
that maybe perhaps in my approach, in my personality, in my nature, Judah, the lion, that's what he means. And so he says it to me again in this church service, and I'm just like, yes, Lord, yes, you, Judah, and me, Judah, us forever, Lord. And I guess the Lord was just tired of the wall. And he says to me, celestial, you are of Judah. You are of the people of her. And this thing, it just, it, it sent the whole, the whole church experience somewhere else. Because the first thing that my soul wanted to do was say, see God, that's where you missed it. Because her was a Levite. And why would, you, would I think that? Because in the moment, word association, her was a very good friend of Moses and his brother Aaron. Her was close to the Levites. And in fact, when Moses was in that pivotal moment where he was seated on that mountain and Joshua and the other youngins were fighting down in the valley below, and whenever Moses would keep his staff up and keep his arms raised, then Israel was prevailing. But when Moses got tired and his arms began to droop, then the enemy was prevailing upon Israel. And so Aaron and her, the good friend, stood on either side of Moses and kept his arms raised the whole day until the battle was settled in the valley. And so word association, you read in the Bible and you just think, oh no, he's a Levite. And what are you saying, God? But the Lord said to me right there in that moment, check it. And so you, I do something that I don't often do in church. I took out my phone. And I put what tribe was her. And if you do that right now, if you pause this video right now, it will tell you that her was of the people of Judah. And this thing, it was one of the biggest diversions in my walk of faith. One of the biggest diversions in my walk of faith. And the reaction I had is not the kind of reaction that most people have. Most people are over the moon. Most people are ecstatic because most people are in the mind of, great, it's our turn now, and it's our, and, and a lot of things. And you know what your minds are in. If I'm talking to you in this video, whether you're American Indian or whether you are of the group that I'm going to make the next video with, I'm not going back to work. I'm going to make these two videos now today because they are important and because the Lord has been impressing on my spirit that he wants them to be done because I have a hundred more still to get through. Then you know what's been on your mind, but my mind didn't go like that. It was a heavy crushing blow for me. It was not easy to take. And that, like I said, is because the Lord had removed so many things already. He had removed so many goalposts already. Did you know that this is not true? Did you know that that is not true? Do you know that they are eating children? Do you know that they're trafficking children? Do you know that this is happening? Do you know that there's a, a second government? So many things. Do you know that Russia will come here? That when this one moved, I just thought, Lord, is anything, can anything stay in place? Can anything just stay in the same spot it was in when I got saved? And so what I'm saying, I came to know sovereignly. I didn't watch a video. And that is why I'm sticking only to what God has given me, only to what he has said. There are many who don't accept and don't believe that American Indians are part of Israel. And I want to ask you, who told you that all of Israel is Judah? Who told you that it's possible for Judah to be all 12 tribes? How can a man give birth to 12 seed and then one seed say all the other 11 seed are me? It, it's not even sensible in the same way that people are arguing and saying, oh no, all of this type of race is Israel. Again, how can they be possible? Were not Japheth and Ham on that boat? Do you think that they have no issue in the earth? Do you think that they have no seed, that they have no children? What Israel is, is a head. You can simply call it the oldest. Doesn't mean that they're the oldest people on earth. They are not, but in terms of how God ranks the nations, God says, this is my firstborn. And so as the firstborn, it is not only that you get certain privileges, you also have certain responsibilities. And the reason that this people has been punished above all others with the slavery, as angry as it makes you, it was deserved because God said that if you broke his covenant, you would become slaves. 
God said that if you were unworthy of keeping covenant, if you were unworthy of the marriage band that he placed upon the finger of your ancestors, then obviously he would rip the band off and with that would come separation and divorce. And divorce in those days is not like divorce now where you can go and cry to a judge and get alimony and get a boyfriend and get child support. You get nothing. Divorced women and widowed women were some of the most shamed women in Israel's communities. In ancient communities, you were a pariah. You were a woman of shame. Look at poor Ruth. She wasn't even divorced. She lost her husband. Look at poor Naomi. Naomi wasn't divorced. She lost her husband. Look at their position when they came back to Israel. It was lower than cows and sheep. They were the object of speculation, whispering, oh, all the time she spent away, she's come home broken and with nothing. They came home under extreme shame extreme shame, difficult circumstances, eating leftovers from whoever was kind enough to share with them, the object of gossip. If that can happen to a human being, why shouldn't that happen to a nation, a people who are disloyal? God is talking to American Indians and said that you forgot yourself. You became unfruitful. You began to worship the creature and not the creator. You started bowing down to fish and wolves and goats Look at the American Indian heritage, the totem poles. Do you see Jesus Christ on that totem pole? And yet, in the back of their minds, they must still be remembering him because the totem poles are straight, but at the top, they always put the eagle, they always put the falcon, and therefore you have a tall pole with the wings out. You have something that looks like a cross. Why are you bowing down and calling yourself a wolf tribe, bear tribe, falcon tribe, e e eagle tribe? Woodpecker tribe, snake tribe. It's the ancient memory in them. But they took their eyes off God. And whenever you take your eyes off God, I promise you the next thing you're going to lose is your mind. That's why America looks the way it does. America took her mind, her eyes off God, and she has lost her mind. This is why she looks rainbow. This is why she sleeps with children all the time. This is why the children themselves are so lewd that they're 14 years old and climbing out of the window to run away with 23-year-old boyfriends. The men are sick and have a hunger for child flesh, and the children themselves, they're not all abused. I don't care how angry you are when you hear this. These children have grown women inside. They do things that grown women fear to do with men, for men. These little girls will take your husband of 25 years and then say, I've had a baby with him, and if you wanted to have a conversation with me, you could always call me woman to woman. These are harlots, hussies. They're frightening, male and female. These young boys are sleeping with powerful executives for Hermes purses. Who are we lying to? This nation has taken her eyes off God. She's become a home of entrapment for the righteous souls. As a righteous soul, if you get vested too much in what is happening here, you're, you're just going to lose it. You're going to have a breakdown, which is why I keep my eyes front. I'm not going to hell for nobody. And so the things I'm bringing you here, I haven't watched anything to bring them to you. The Lord has given them to me. And contrary to what most people do, I didn't start a personal YouTube channel to talk about, oh, look at what I know. Look at what I know. I'm able to keep this stuff until death if necessary. You want rights as Israel? You have responsibilities. And it's time that you began to look inside with everything and live up to them. Because heaven isn't free. You hear of enslavement coming, and I see all the time in my comments, slaves, who's going to be slaves? Why owe you if you live immoral? The slavery that is coming is not only for those who perpetrated slavery. It is for whoever lives ungodly, especially the area of sexual immorality. The judgment is to be stripped naked and taken into captivity. And that judgment is for all the people who own OnlyFans. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what background you have. 
If you are part of this porn industry, if you are stripping in Atlanta, there are plenty of Israelites that are going to ride these boats. I told you that I've seen their skin colors. I wouldn't tell you that the Chinese and the Russians would be captivated by the shapes of black women if there were no black women who are going to go on those boats. If you don't want to be one of them, straighten up and fly right. You don't want to be a Latina getting on that boat with the promise of God wasted at your feet. Straighten up and fly right. Stop being immoral, whether you are married or not. You don't need to ask me, Celestial, what is immorality? You know, because the law of God is written on all our hearts. Good and evil is written on all our hearts, and you have no need for anyone to instruct you in what pleases God and what is offensive to the Father. There's no exceptions. If you are living immoral, you will get caught up in this judgment because the Lord says when the captors come here, they will know in and of themselves who is a perpetrator and who is not. So the choices are all on your side of the dashboard. You are being given the choice to basically build your happy meal any way that you want. Grace is available. Mercy is available. Mercy is available. If you don't want it, you don't have to add it to your menu. You can simply be one of those that has a, a male roster, a female roster. Keep your roster. And then when the conquerors come and they start calling roll call, then you will know. An eye for an eye, a life for a life, and foul for foul, naked for naked. You will have nobody to blame by your, for, your, for your situation but yourself. And so God is saying that the American Indians are his people. You are my people and I know you very well and I've been with you since the time of the stars. I would suppose the time of the stars is just since creation, since there was just God by himself. And he says he knows their names intimately. So all the names that they have for the different tribes, God is the author of those names. He knows their names and if you look in the Bible, you will see that very God is very much peculiar about this thing. Um, I will number you according to the, the Father's houses. I will number you according to the Father's houses. He's very, very um, particular about that. And he says, all the names are engraved upon his hunting belt. And you can hear here, when God says hunting belt, this is particular language that will be special to American Indians. It's special to them. They have that belt when they go out. And he says that he will pay the ransom for their souls because he can see that they're discouraged and they're dying in poverty. And they think that he is silent and brutal because he's been looking at all their pain and doing nothing. And this is the pain since they lost everything that they had. This is the pain since American Indians were brutally attacked by the people who came here in the early years when America appeared to be uninhabited, but it was not uninhabited. And they were enslaved also by Mr. Columbus, who came and just built himself a brand new world, pillaged the place, took everything back. And these people were raped. These people were harmed. These people were deliberately subjected to genocide. The one I know of is setting setting them on fire in their teepees. The other one I know of is um, giving them the blankets deliberately infected with smallpox. And these things were not done by mistake. So let no one be disingenuous here. None of these things happened by mistake. And so uh, God is saying that he saw all this and he did not intervene. And this is what those who are listening, who now hear that there is a judgment coming, must understand. If God is saying that he will, he will bring... He will requite the blood that was shed, and he's going to do it through conquerors. He's going to do it through Russia and China. He's going to also do it through disease. He's going to do it through war, um, where people will fight themselves here and kill themselves here and thereby reduce their numbers, exactly as it says in the book of Obadiah. It's just one chapter. You can read it. Then... If he's not going to intervene now, then you must understand that he's doing exactly what he did back then when the people who were being attacked and the people who were being decimated and they were being genocided and they needed him and he was watching and he didn't do anything. Why? Because it was the punishment. We must never lose sight of the fact that it was the earned punishment for unfaithfulness to God. So if he did not intervene then, then he's saying that he will not intervene now. And... 
those who were suffering then, the American Indians, um, thought that he was a brutal and a silent witness to their pain. And those sentiments also exist in the African American community. They have thought that God has been a brutal witness, silent witness to their pain. There are a lot of African Americans who don't care about God at all. They mock when they hear about God, they mock when they hear the word of God, and they're like, you're still believing those lies, those European lies, and it's odd to watch people reject not only their creator, but their father, their maker, their history. You throw the Bible away, and then you claim you have no history. Where are you going to find it from if you don't look in the history book that's talking about you? And so um, God says that he will pay the ransom for uh, those who are still living. So you can't pay a ransom for those who have passed on. Just a moment, please. So he's going to pay the ransom and redeem them and bring them out of the cottages that they were driven in. And that's just the reservation. The areas where American Indians were pushed off, put there, um, not the best areas for farming, for planting, and then plied with alcohol. This is an old tactic that's been used for so many decades in America where you will put people into the most, the ugliest neighborhoods and the worst place, and then you will deliberately establish um, pipelines of destruction in there. It could be alcohol. I think in the 80s it was crack and things like that. You will pump in vices, strip clubs and everything that destroy neighborhoods into those places and then step back. And when the community begins to access those things and destroy themselves, then you run to MSNBC and Fox News and make a lot of news broadcasts and say, well, you see, this is what they want to do and stuff like that. And... So it goes. And so God says, the, his people have been dying in poverty and driven and limited. But now he says that he has an inheritance for them that he promised them in the canon of his word. He's Yahweh. He identifies himself by his name, Yahweh, your father. And then he reminds them that the name they were calling him as they were forgetting him, great spirits. It's only the American Indians that do that. They always talk of one big spirit, one large spirit. And he says, in the days to come, He's going to start speaking to this community in dreams and visions. And I want to tell you, he says, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And I want to tell you that this is going to start happening across the world to the genuine Israelite community. You're going to start having dreams that you don't even understand. You're going to start having dreams where God is starting to bring the revelation to you. And the reason is that because the people are not waking up fast enough. So there's some people who have woken up and they know what time it is and they know what God is planning to do. This is going to be the biggest shift in all of human history, in all of human history. This, this is prophecy standing literally as tall as you want in the earth. This is going to be the biggest thing because there's a whole bulk of unfulfilled prophecy in the Bible that revolves around the standing up of true Israel before the world begins to revert back to how it used to be. The world is going to go back to how it used to be. It's basically going to head back to default settings. So you're going to see, for instance, I was speaking about the athletic, uh, athleticism of this man that I saw in the vision. And you're going to start to see these children in the Israelite community coming out with your child will be able to play the harp and you know that harp is not something that we're playing in this community at all I would guess there's just one anomaly here and there but they're going to come with extraordinary gifts they're going to come with extraordinary anointing they're going to come back with you're going to see these babies coming out with such powerful sports ability that will make the sports ability of now look almost laughable compared to how tall and strong they will grow. And then you ask him and he's like, oh, I'm nine. And people will think, no, test him for steroids, test him, test him. And his pee is going to be clean. That will just be his genes, his bones coming out like that. And so that's one of the things that I have seen. And that's one of the things that God has said to me. Again, I'm not watching that off any video. So, um, the world is going to go back to default settings and this community is going to start dreaming so that they can wake up at the speed that God wants because people are not waking up. People are busy watching uh, criminal podcasts and they're doing everything but actually getting themselves in position 
for God's timing. And I can tell you that God is not going to wait on the community much longer. God has places to go and things to do and places to be. And he is done waiting. That is why you see time is moving so fast. The Lord is allowing that for the days to be shortened for the sake of the elect. And it's not only the elect, those who have faith in God. There's also this elect, the firstborn, the first child. You are not only children. Please hear it and understand and start to adjust your hearts and realize that heaven is going to have all the colors, all the backgrounds, all the nations, a great multitude. It's not just going to be you and you're simply going to have to deal with that. Those of you who have such small hearts that you think that everything is about you, it is not. A large proportion is, but not all of it. It's impossible. Jesus did not die on the cross for only us. There are many who are going to come to the cross and we should not be the reason that they are stumbled. And yes, I said that. I said what I said. You should not stumble a brother or a sister on their way to salvation. You do not have that right. Jesus doesn't belong to you anymore. I mean only. He doesn't. That is why Paul, such an effective apostle, working as hard as all the others in a bunch, he just went off by himself and just look at how many letters he wrote, how many churches he established right in the midst of Gentile places and they came to faith. That proves that the gospel is a seed that can grow anywhere. It can grow anywhere. It can grow in Papua New Guinea. It can grow in Japan. It can grow anywhere. And so uh, God will lead the American Indians back to the inheritance that he promises them in the canon of the word. He identifies himself and says that in, dream, in days to come, dreams and vision will multiply greatly in their communities. The old and the young will see visions and dreams. And he says, and then you will remember yourselves. You're going to come back to your proper mind. And then I will gather you from all the places where I scattered you and where I let you forget yourselves because of your unfaithfulness towards me when you shunned me and you bow down to idols in nature, trees and owl and fish. And so you hear this prophecy is from the middle of the year, 2019, June, 2019. And God is saying in this prophecy, I will gather you. So then this again flies in the face of conventional wisdom that Israel that is fighting Palestine at the moment is true Israel. God cannot be saying I will to describe something that the entire world has told us has already been done. We have been taught in church, in all the churches, that Israel in the Middle East is the real Israel. Send your tithe to Israel, support Israel, pray for the prosperity of Israel. Where you've been praying for the prosperity of the wrong thing, respectfully. God has not gathered his people. God is still in the process of trying to wake up his people. God is still in the process of trying to clean up his people. God is still in the process of trying to get his people to come away from their multitudinous sins and become a holy people. So that when they speak of themselves and say Israel, people can say, well, there's something to look at here. There's something to respect here. God allowed Israel to be scattered and he allowed Israel to be despised because Israel broke all the rules. And since the Bible is a book of rules, the rules say that breaking the rules will bring on a new and a different experience that nobody's going to like. So the new and the different experience happened and they didn't like it. And now the time for it is up and God is now saying that he's going to requite those who did that. I will gather you from everywhere that I scattered you. He says you raised up effigies. So again, think of the American Indian totem poles. Think of all these little things that they had in their community, you know, oh, the owl of the, the order of the owl and the order of the wolf. No, you, you can't go around worshiping bush and trees. When God is standing right there, you need to read Romans chapter one. God is so against idolatry. God is so against the lifting up of unclean things to substitute him. It is such, it is so disrespectful. It's like, it's like you build a house and then somebody comes and just praise the house. What a glorious house, beautiful house, beautiful eaves. Oh my goodness. Have you seen that front foyer? And you never say a word to the architect. He's standing right there. And at first he's blessed that you can appreciate his creation, but then he's listening and you go on for 10, 20, 30 minutes, just exclaiming at the beauty of the house. And the person who designed the house is right there. And you can't even say two words like good job. It's an insult. 
It's such an insult. It's an affront. It's what the Bible calls an affront. Affront is a sharp insult that will cause someone to bridle, to bristle. It's where you see rich ladies going, how dare you? That's what an affront is. And that's what all who fall under this community have done to God. So if your first, second, and fifth year's response is only to go, oh, it's almost time, and there's not a word of repentance in your mouth, may I, may I ask you to mind your manners when it comes to Jesus Christ? May I just ask you politely to mind your manners and to check yourself and to come back into full realization of what is going on here? You owe God an apology and it's not just an apology of your, of your mouth. You owe him an apology of your whole soul, of your whole self. You owe him to lie prostrate and say, I don't even know what my generations have done. And I'm speaking to those in the community and those outside. The world owes God an apology. And as long as I'm sitting here, as long as I have the leave of God to speak, I will never stop reminding all living, you owe God an apology. He died on the cross for you. He did his share. You owe the Lord an apology for everything. It's not so that you can live under condemnation. It's not so you can keep crouching like a little mouse. Oh, I am nothing. No, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are the living reflection of the Father's face. Whatever you look like at this moment, if you have put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ, you are his child. You are known to him. He is merely handling some in-house business at this time that has to be handled. It has to be handled. It has to be settled. It's must. It, it must be settled. It, it's in the Bible. It's prescribed. It's prophesied. It, it has to be handled. It must be dealt with. Scales have to be balanced or God could not be just. And that is his nature, to be just. But when it comes to repentance, if you don't have a repentant heart, then don't even worry about being in community, out of community. You're basically outside. You're completely outside the circle that is called salvation. So God is going to make the American Indians understand by his power that he is their God. And he says that he will forgive them for all the idolatry and the bowing down to other images that they have done. And he's also going to decorate them with recognition and respect as a special inheritance, according to end times Bible prophecy. He will call them by their individual names, Pawnee, Shawnee, Blackfoot, Crow, and so many others. And then I saw this vision. I saw men of all ages and races wearing the full dress of the American Indian. They, some of them were just dressed like the normal braves. I think they have something that they wear around their neck that they can even wear over their t-shirts now. Something that sometimes has no sleeves. Some have full sleeves. But then I saw people dressed all the way up to the full chief where they have the headdress um, coming down the back. And they were standing in traditional clothes and they were being recognized by the U.S. government. And it was men of all different complexions. So some of them were so dark. You would mistake them to be, I don't know, full African, Sudanese, something like that. So dark skinned with strong African features. And then some of them, they could almost pass for white, the quality of hair, um, the skin tone like that. And so um, it was all ranges of the color standing there. And people were clapping at this event. Some people were very emotional. Some people were crying. And these men that were being honored, only a few of them were smiling. Most of them were not smiling. Most of them had such serious faces because as the event was taking place, uh, they were remembering. And I saw that some of them were brought up on stage. So it was these men's faces that I was seeing in the vision. Some of them were brought up on stage. And as speeches were being made, I saw these men were remembering and written on their hearts with the words, this is not enough. It is not enough. So they didn't want to let it go. They didn't want to just have a neat little ceremony and then we forgive and we move on. And I think that other cultures need to be respectful that when people say an, an, an issue is complex, when people say, no, you don't know how deep this goes, then I think to even be in the room, much less granted a seat at the table, you need to be respectful of the, time, of the fact that you cannot be part of a group that perpetrates grave wrongs and then also presume that you are the one who will tell the group that you hurt. Okay, it's enough. I think we should cut it off here. I think it's enough. I think we should put it behind ourselves. You can't. I spoke about this in, I think just a recent video where I said that you cannot sin against someone and then say, 
okay, you're doing too much. What I did was only a three or a four, but you're at an eight or nine and you're just, you're overreacting. You cannot do this. This is complete lack of self-awareness. So just understand that. So these people, despite the honoring and everything else that was happening, whatever the government will do in the future, on their hearts, I saw the word, the words, this is not enough. But I also saw that God will speak to these men personally, and he will ease their pain in the times to come. And here is why God has purpose for all the tribes. God has purpose for all the 12 tribes and God has purpose for the tribes within the American Indians. The American Indians have kept their bloodlines and their genealogies and they've kept it. They've actually remember it, right? So he has purpose for them and he will not want them to be operating from a place of unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, pain, and looking back. Why? Because I said that God is a busy guy. He has things to do and places to go and things to get accomplished so that he can bring his marvelous eternal kingdom. And so I saw that God will reveal to them his purpose among them. And then I saw that the leaders of the American Indians will begin to gather and they will have the bright light of Christianity in their hearts. So too bad to people who mock Christianity and I'm not a Christian. Well, good for you. Be whatever you want to be. Because part of the problem of Christianity is begging people all the time to be Christian. None of you has ever gone and taken an unripe mango, bitter and green, leaking that milky sap and said, you know what? This unripe, unprepared thing is exactly what I want to give me the belly ache of a lifetime. Nobody does that. And yet the Christian community will constantly try to pluck unripe people because they think that the gospel is something that can bludgeon and batter people into saying, okay, I'll be a Christian. No, when the heart is ready, the gospel falls in there and beautiful seeds come out. That is why the Bible says that we are to those who are being saved as a wonderful fragrance, but we are a stench, a stink to those who are perishing. So there are people perishing. Their hearts are bad ground. They do not want the Lord. But Christianity is not to be mocked and it's not to be cast aside. It's not called non-anity. It's called Christianity because Christ is in the center of it. He is at the center of the story and nobody, no narrative, not even the promises of the Old Testament will ever weave him out. Just understand that. We live and serve at his request. And so I saw the tribes walking as they will be walking in the end times. And I'm telling you, the light of God was coming off them, piercingly brilliant, very beautiful. And that light was faith. The faith that is inside the American Indian community. I'm telling you, when God sovereignly begins to work in this community, when God sovereignly begins to work in the hearts of his people, the light that will come off them will be brilliant because this is a group of people who will believe. They will have a revelation of the true nature of God and they will know without a doubt that he is everything. The last thing I saw is God gave me an understanding of how these people came to be here in the Americas. So this is what I saw. And when I tell you, I had to hunt to find any evidence of this. And I found only, I think it's about maybe one or two paragraphs in some old paper that somebody wrote. And I don't know the paper. I really had to hunt. What I saw was I saw the American Indian people winding their way across the earth. They came from another place. And I think that place was Africa because what I saw was the continents were smooshed together closer than they are now. Right now, the continents, at least the way they draw it for us, are quite far apart and there's quite, quite a lot of water. But the way I was seeing it is Africa and America used to touch at the upper part let me, let me get it right. Africa is drawn like this. And then at the top, it has, I think a little pointy bit in the top left upper corner. So it, that bit was much closer to America than it is now. They almost seem to be either touching or close together. But what happened was the people walked up 
They may not have started in Africa. They may have come from somewhere else, but I saw them walking up the upper part of Africa and then they went up left towards where America is. They came and they sang a song. That is what I saw. So I didn't write in full what I saw. So let me not start trying to read from here, okay? They walked up the upper part of Africa and then they went upper left to where it was kind of linked to America or something. And the way they were walking, they looked like little toys. So they were walking single file, men, women, and the chief was in the front. So this is how I could mark their progress. The chief was in the front with the eagle feather thing. And they went up and they turned a little bit and they went that way in the corner. And then they came to a place where there was water. So they came to where they couldn't walk anymore. And then they sang a song. They sang a song and land came up and they walked across on that land. That is what I saw. I followed the little headdress with all the people walking behind him in a line and they kind of hung a left up to the corner there. And then America was there, but you couldn't see, but they sang a song. They sang a song like they sang to God or something, God help us or something. And then land came up in the water and then they walked across there that way. And then they came into America and then the land went back down and they rested in America. And what they thought was no one will ever find us here. So that was very pertinent in their hearts. That, that is what was in their hearts. They were thinking we're safe here. No one will ever find us here. And so they were in that place in America and they were isolated there for a very long time but Columbus found them. So um, what they thought was, we are safe. They will never find us here. We will worship God. But then what I saw is as they spent time after time after time being alone for so long, they began to forget who they were. They began to forget who God was. And they began to do all kinds of monstrosities that they should not have done including human sacrifice. And this is now where you can understand why the Lord is saying, my people are scattered abroad. They live, they are here in the Americas. This is Canada, the United States, but also they live in Mexico and South America. And now you have understanding of, I guess, some of these um, ancient civilizations that were cutting people up and chopping them up and things like that. So, um, that is what I saw. They forgot who they were. They forgot who God was. And they began to partake, partake of all sorts of monstrosities that they should never have done, including human sacrifice. They sacrificed to idols and they worshiped the totem poles as God. And God became very angry. He let them be uncovered, attacked, made naked and exposed but now he will repay their, atta their attackers a life for a life. And that is all that has been revealed to me. And so that is the word of the Lord. Um, as I've received it, this prophecy is nearly five years old, June the 7th, 2019. Part four, the Slavery Chronicles, and the title is Buffalo Soldiers. So I am Celestial, and this is the Master's Voice. As I said, this topic is still highly contentious, but as we can see, if you just do your own um, research, which I always recommend you do, you will see that uh, the world is waking up. Uh, I know the children are trying to fight back with their Starbucks, whatever thing that they're doing, um, but the world is waking up to a deeper truth. And this is... The placement of people, placements of people is essential to end times prophecy. So, uh, for instance, Psalm 83, we've already covered Psalm 83 here. The Psalm 83 war and Exodus one is called, and then the other prophecy is simply reading out Psalm 83. God didn't tell me to say anything about it. He just told me, read out these scriptures in their hearing. So when you hear God say, read this out, then it's good for you to go and do the research. It's good for you to go and read on your own. But because there are so many powerful biblical, biblical visitations and prophecies outstanding, 
It's essential to know who is who and what is going to happen to who. And the reason for that is this. God is going to do things exactly according to how he's going to do them, which is why I said I don't get into arguments with people. You can fight over, for instance, the chart all day. But in the end, imagine when he begins the gathering and then you see, for instance, the American Indians there. What are you going to do? You're going to be stuck. Israel is everywhere. There are even Israelites who are still in Africa. There are Israelites who are still in Africa. And then people will say, no, that's not true. But just ask yourself, if all the apples were in one place and then some, Johnny came and took some of the apples, not all of them, where do you think the descendants of the other apples are? Not every Israelite has been a slave. There's some Israelites that have never tasted slavery. The colonialists didn't grab every Israelite. They grabbed a lot of them. They took them to all these little islands that are dotted around, but not every one. Israel is scattered far abroad. I was walking just the other day and the Lord is telling me, tell them that my people are everywhere. They are scattered. The Lord says that there's not a land where his people are not there. Can you comprehend this? Does the chart cover that for you? The way people are just, okay, this part is yours, this part is yours. Who are you to start dividing identities to people? I'm just saying. When the Lord starts the gathering, who you see gathered is who's there. And then everyone is just going to have to get along with everyone else. This is why it's saying in Isaiah 11, Ephraim will not vex Judah and Judah will not vex Ephraim. This is literally a picture called stop fighting among yourselves for position. Even Jesus' disciples had this disease. So you can tell it's a unique sibling disease. God bless you. I am Celestial. This is the Master's voice. And until I see you again, goodbye.